Good evening and a warm welcome to our second Eclipse webinar. My name is Dr. Marta Jaskowska. I work at SWPS University here in Poland, and we are a co-organizer of these wonderful seminars. Um, just to remind you very briefly that the main aim of our webinars is um, to promote Eclipse and also to create a common platform that can bring together Eclipse members, clinical psychologists, researchers, practitioners, and clinicians who are interested in and passionate about mental health. Uh, today, in a few seconds, uh, we are going to be very privileged to uh, listen to a very stimulating keynote lecture from Professor Claudia Bokting, who works at Amsterdam University Medical Center, and she's, of course, the president of Eclipse. Um, in a few seconds, we will have uh, Professor Winfried Reef, also from Eclipse, who will introduce Claudia in few words. Um, and then after the keynote lecture, we will have a short break and then we will follow with a panel discussion. And again, we are very privileged to have an amazing panel uh, that includes Professor Christina Botella, uh, Dr. Maria Karekla and Dr. Uh, Eiko Fried. And again, we are spoiled to have Professor Winfried as our host. And last but not least, a uh, warm welcome and um, good evening to all listeners who have joined us live to, to watch the debate and listen to discussions. Um, please use the chat function available on the YouTube channel and ask questions. We will try to answer as many of them as possible. And thank you for listening. And now over to you, Winfried. Good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you and uh, to welcome you to our second uh, webinar. We decided uh, to talk about the topic of basic concepts of mental disorders. Just imagine if we have a wrong platform for our diagnosis uh, and for as a concept for mental disorders, then maybe all of our research uh, might not lead to a successful end. That means we have to reflect about the common ground of, of our uh, concepts of mental disorders uh, and to, to think about whether we have to improve it or we have, whether we have to change it. There's a lot of agreement nowadays that our current approach to classify mental disorders using uh, categories of, of psychopathology might not be the best platform to process and to progress in our field. And therefore, I'm very happy that we'll have a, a keynote lecture of Claudie on this topic and a panel discussion, late, discussion later on with Christina, Maria and Eiko. Claudie is our president of EA Clip, uh, which is already indicating that she's a really, really important person. Uh, she published many studies on depression and also on e-health interventions. And currently, she, she's also the director of a Center for Urban Mental Health, which is a real great, uh, fantastic center that has been established in Amsterdam together with different uh, universities contributing to it. I have to uh, tell you a little anecdote about Claudie. During the last years, whenever I started with a new topic, I was searching the literature for it. And it was always a publication of Claudie that indicated to me, oh, Claudie is working on this topic since several years. So I'm too late to be really innovative, but I have to follow the route that Claudie has opened. And this was always a very good way to go. So I'm very happy, Claudie, that you will present your ideas today. So I will be uh, at, at the same level as you. And uh, we are really uh, looking forward to it. So welcome, Claudie. The stage is yours. Now, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, this is also the editor of uh, Clinical Psychology Europe, and it's really nice to hear that the editor actually thinks I'm an important person. I'm not. I think the whole board is very important to represent uh, the European clinical psychologists, whether it's clinicians or researchers or scientists, petitioners, so that we have a voice not only when it comes to research money, but also in the European Parliament. But I was not allowed to talk about that, so um, I would like to talk about something else. And now I go to my slides and probably you, you see them. I want to talk about zooming out. 
um, and um, the title is Zoom Out, Understanding the Onset and Maintenance of Common Mental Health Conditions Using a Complex Systems Approach. And I, why, yeah, what I would like to do, I want, want you to take a bit on a, like, yeah, a bit of a route, some thinking, I, some ideas, and I want to share it with you. So why is it important to think about other approaches? Now, there is an urgency, and this is something from history. Uh, these, this was from the World Health Organization, published uh, a while ago, I think in 2015 or something. And there they already alarmed us that the number, the actual number of people with depression and anxiety is increasing worldwide. And, and these are the common mental health conditions. And some of you might argue with me and say, no, you have to add as well addiction. And you're right about that. The top three of the common mental health conditions indeed are anxiety, depression, and addiction. Now we're facing the COVID pandemic. And what you see here on the left are the the increase of prevalence rates of depression and on the right of anxiety disorders. And what you clearly see a sharp increase of the prevalence of anxiety disorders and depression worldwide. You see some differences per country, um, but it's important to be aware it's not only because of the virus itself, but also partly because of all kinds of policy and uh, that many of you in Europe also were confronted with. For instance, what about a lockdown or school closure or, you know, uh, what again, like closing the pubs at five o'clock or something like that. So you, you, you clearly see an association between a decrease of mobility and lockdown and all these kind of things and an increase of uh, depression. So it's more urgent than ever to think about mental health and we are here all yeah with all of you and and probably you're very interested not only in mental health but also on um, what to do about it and in this presentation i want to start with making the case why we should zoom out and move beyond simplification and I will also discuss a bit, yeah, what would be pathways, what, what would be ways that we could think about that we could do this. I want to stress that it's important that we focus on actionable links for interventions and also for policy making. And I also want to make the case that maybe we have to zoom out from focusing on the individual a bit more to also to the society. And I want to stop or end this talk with why research is still needed. And this might for some of you be a bit of a bummer, but I think research can actually be done partly in clinical practice. So then it's not uh, the one or the other. Okay, so I go to my next slide. Why should we move beyond simplification? What's the current status? So the good news is we do have effective treatment. Sort of half of the people do respond to psychological treatments. So that's really something. If you talk to people in the medical field, so the medical somatic specialists, they say, woo, that's really something, especially if it's dem demonstrated against other type of care. Have, for instance, not wait list, but for instance, other type of care, like for instance, treatment with some kind of antidepressants or other types of care. So be aware, sort of 50% of the people do respond to current treatments all over the place. So for most common mental health, uh, for most mental health conditions. But we mostly focus on the individual. And now I see already some people disagreeing with me. Okay. I go along with you. Of course, we include sometimes the family or we have even even a family family therapy. And also sometimes we include schools or a neighborhood and so on. But we hardly ever, ever intervene on a societal level. And there is a bit of a problem because our the effect sizes of our treatments actually did not increase over time. So if you're a very, very positive person, you could say uh, the last 30 years it did not increase. And be aware, we're already in 2020. Yeah? So since 1990, 
no increase. But some of us or some experts say, no, it's already since the 70s, 80s, that you do not find any indication that there were new interventions that were more effective. And maybe some of you now say, ho, ho, ho. What about acceptance and commitment and mindfulness and EMDR? The effect size are sort of comparable also with new treatments. That doesn't mean that they are not meaningful. For instance, think of all the work that have been done on online interventions. They are effective as well. And the good thing about them is they are also, if delivered in the right way, are also highly accessible. So I'm not saying there is no progress, but on the effect size, we could debate on it whether there is, in pro there is progress. Now, you could say maybe there's something wrong with the classification and diagnostic models, as uh, Professor Reed, Reef, sorry, already mentioned. But you could also say maybe our theoretical models, our underlying models, maybe there's something wrong with, uh, with them. So these etiological models that actually explain why one person gets, for instance, a depression, whereas another person not. So what we did with this team, and they're still laughing here later on, you find out why it was not fun to do that. We did a systematic search on the evidence for the leading etiological model that actually feed into current treatments of depression, also biological and psychological and gene environment and la la la. So basically, we examined, did these factors indeed are these factors as derived from these etiological models? Are they at least, yeah, predictive before there was, for instance, in this case, a depression? And we examined psychological models like the cognitive model, the behavioral model, what is it, all kind of diathesis, stress models, personality-based models, neurobiological model, and also gene environment mod models. So what did we find? Ah, that was a bit of a thing because it was like finding a needle in a haystack. So we found almost 140,000 articles that claimed to examine etiological factors for, in this case, the onset or maintenance for depression. But when we went through it and be aware, this was a large team. You're still smiling at the beginning. It turned out that less than 0.1% actually study this. So most of the studies actually studied it at the moment that people were already depressed. So then that's interesting because then it could play a role in the maintenance. But then you do not know, is this also an important factor for etiological models? Um, by the way, we didn't find any evidence for more neurobiological factors that they indeed predicted onset in this case of depression. And these papers in the meantime are all uh, published. So if you don't believe me, and I think you should not, because I, was, I also ins I did not believe it at first, and then you can all uh, uh, discuss it or you can read it a bit more. Maybe important to be aware, this is not the full literature. Eh? We only focused on the main, the leading models that feed into treatment, for instance, antidepressants, CBT, psychodynamic treatment, interpersonal tree treatment. Eh? So only the leading ones. So what did we find? We found actually scarce evidence for these leading and mostly biopsychosocial models. We did, by the way, find some evidence for the cognitive model. It was quite consistent. And, and you do know that many of the studied interventions are actually cognitive behavioral uh, therapy and yeah so the cognitive part there is indeed some evidence there and what is even more important and surprising the majority of all these studies and this has been reported before did study no more than one or two factors and this is interesting because we did a whole interview round with all kind of experts in the field internationally. And then we asked them, OK, what kind of factors are important for the onset and maintenance of depression? And almost everyone said, yeah, these are biological factors, psychological factors, social factors. And this also includes, of course, what is it? Trauma, 
uh, live events, but also, for instance, social economic status. There was actually no one that said there's only one factor. But interestingly, the majority of the study only focused on one of one or two factors. And now at the moment, with the Center for Urban Mental Health, we are actually performing or conducting a mega meta study with help of AI. This is impossible to do by hand. And then we do not only focus on these leading models, but actually on all factors that somehow were mentioned in all kinds of models for anxiety disorders, addiction, and also depressive disorder. And then we also include uh, other environmental, environmental factors, like, for instance, social the, the neighborhood or urbanicity on, and all these kind of factors. There are no results yet, but I think we had about three to four million uh, articles that claim to study that. So I think in March or something, we will be able to uh, show you some first presents uh, results. So you might consider mental health conditions as complex systems. Uh, there's one thing many of us agree on, but not everyone, is that you cannot find a single underlying cause for a mental health condition, even not for something like schizophrenia. And usually it's defined by, by the symptomatology, having symptoms. So most of you yeah, are aware of the DSM and the ICD. So, so in a way, you, you, collect, you, you ask for symptoms and then if there are symptoms and there is an like, impact on daily life, then you classify one of those conditions. And the problem is that we clearly now also, because of a lot of work, like Eiko Fried, who is also one of our panelists later on, but also Danny Bosbone and many others, that one symptom can trigger the other. For instance, I wanted to say, imagine you don't have a lot of sleep, but of course, all of us should have had some time that sleep was not so good. Then if, if you don't sleep well, it can have an effect on concentration. You have concentration problems, but also in my case, if I don't sleep well, I also get a bit low. I get sad mood. And especially if it's continuing for a couple of days. And sad mood can trigger, for instance, suicidal ideation. This is just some examples of how having a symptom or experiencing something can trigger other symptoms. And before you know, know it, it spreads it. Mental health conditions are, are complex to study because we think it's, it's the result of the interplay between emotions, cognitions, our physiological or biological response, and also how they interact with the environment. And also our environment is not static at all. Every day something new happens, right? Um, so you could perceive this like a sort of a dancing system that is constantly moving. So it changes over time. And you can imagine that these changes over time can also be different per individual. So that might be hard to study. And it's also uh, now, sorry, I'm only here to raise problems, but later on, I will be a bit more optimistic, I promise you. But but also if you have symptoms, if you feel low, for instance, if you feel really sad, this already has an impact on your cortisol levels. And this has an impact on your stress axis, on the HPA axis. So having symptoms already has an impact on factors that might also play a role in triggering it. Another example, feeling sad also gives you a bit more talent to have negative cognitions, right? And that again, nah, I think you get the point. So bringing this all together, you could say it's not static, it's dynamic or more a dynamical system. So maybe we have to perceive mental health conditions or mental health problems as yeah, very challenging uh, conditions that are maybe defined as complex systems. Now there is, um, in other fields of science, they actually um, they actually try to work with all kind of dancing systems. And um, the field that is working on that is actually complexity science. And complexity science um, is applied in many fields, for instance, to explain criminal networks. What's the best way to target a criminal network? Should we wait till we have Al Capone? 
or should we maybe um, uh, target at another place? And I can predict you already, we shouldn't wait till we have Al Capone. It's better to target somewhere a person that cannot be easily replaced, like the electrician, because if you wait for targeting Al Capone, the criminal network learns and gets more aggressive. I'm not allowed to talk about this right now. Let's go back to mental health. But it has also been used to explain frailty in elderly or to explain mor mass mortality among fish in shallow lakes. And it has already been applied uh, in mental health to explain, for instance, comorbidity. How is it possible that so many people have comorbidity, not only, for instance, anxiety, but also depression or not only PTSD, but also addiction. And you can maybe explain this by that one symptom triggers the other and the other. Yeah? And this has been done, for instance, by uh, studying symptom networks, like, for instance, by Danny Borschbaum, Angelique Kramer, and many, of course, Eiko Fried as well, Laura Bringman. There are many, many that work on that. And not only on symptom networks, but the cool stuff is they're now also replacing the symptoms by psychological mechanisms, for instance, avoidance. Okay, so how can we move beyond the simplification? And what do I mean with simplification? That you focus on one to two factor and just you act like there is no world around this person with other influences. First of all, I think we have to embrace the complexity and we have to zoom out literally and use our knowledge as clinical psychologists, because we do have a lot of knowledge, that we know, for instance, how to intervene in the individual or in the direct environment, in the family. Also to intervene maybe, or think about intervention on societal levels. So think, for instance, about policy level interventions. And we have to zoom out, break free, from our clinical psychology departments or psychology departments, we have to connect to other disciplines. So, and one of the things that we try to do in the Center for Urban Mental Health, which is an interdisciplinary um, center of the University of Amsterdam, and there we are daily confronted with computational scientists, with complex system scientists, with sociologists, with, of course, also neuroscientists, psychologists, whatever, but also people who actually do nothing else than and, and, uh, working on how to create a new part of the city, like urban planning and architecture and so on. And what we try to do is a basic framework that actually zooms out, that actually tries to map all these factors that might be of importance, not only the individual factors that we study, uh, many times, for instance, affect fluctuation or cognitive, head, like your, your beliefs or schema, but also behavior, but also on social level, like the impact of the family. Of course, we've done that also many times in our field, but also the impact of school intervention and so on, but also more on a macro level, you could say. You could examine the impact of city factors, but even on a national or on an international level. And what we actually try to do is how all these feedback, uh, how all these fat feed, uh, sorry, how all these factors feed into for the individual, but also have a feedback to, for instance, the onset of symptomatology, but also spreading of the symptomatology forth and back. And this is just an in initial framework. And from this on, we actually do all kind of PhD projects that actually focuses on, on part of it. So, for instance, some people work on microbiome target targeting microbiome to see whether this might have a good effect on affect uh, fluctuation, but also some work actually on more urban factors and examine what's the effect on this. And the cool stuff is there are a lot of methodology, sorry, methodologies that try to actually connect all these levels as well, because that's not so easy. Okay. Maybe you might think, OK, that's nice. But what about the actionable links? Yeah, the main reason why we do this is we have as main mission to find new 
um, actionable links to develop interventions as well as to see whether we can develop policy interventions. So what we are discussing and thinking about and doing studies and where to, where would be the optimal targets? And I just want to say to you, I don't know if you see my pointer, but I think many times we target here or here. And I just want to challenge the field of clinical psychology maybe to target a bit more on this level, because then we can be maybe reach far more people than we, we are used to. So that is the main reason why we work on this, because we want to explore where to target the best. And also we do some simulation part and so on to, to find this out. Now you could think like, okay, this is too ambitious, this is not impossible, but the opposite, we actually were confronted with like very recent, we're in it right now. There are some lessons learned from the COVID pandemic. And the main lesson, now there are many lessons, I'm very sorry, but one of the, the main message, yeah, messages that, that at least I came up with is that policy actually has an enormous impact on mental health. In the beginning, I discussed with you that the prevalence of anxiety disorders and depression worldwide is enormously increasing with COVID. And there seems to be an impact of policy making on this increase. So we do find indication and there was just recently a meta analysis out on this topic that clearly showed, for instance, school closure has an enormous impact on the increase of prevalence of mental health conditions. And the same holds for probably lockdowns and um, all kind of other measures that has been done policy measures. And now you could say, of course, that's the opposite. But I think actually in my life, this is the first time that I have no doubt anymore and actually proof that policy can have a big, big impact on the onset, but also the maintenance of mental health conditions. So what if we could help policymakers to intervene on this? And this could have a big impact on the prevention, but maybe also on the curation of mental health conditions. Later on, we do have a panel discussion and uh, maybe um, there will be some discussion on this and I will fight for this position. Okay, but maybe now I go back again on what complex systems could offer us to innovate our interventions and maybe also make it more effective. So let's go back again to targeting individual levels, because many of, many of us do treatments of individuals. Now, I already discussed that there are, it's possible now to create um, yeah, individual symptom networks. And in these networks, if you, for instance, fill in an app a couple of weeks, several times a day of how you're feeling, or it also is your symptomatology, you can get an individual network that gives you a bit of an idea what kind of symptom might be the one, now yeah, we have to be a bit careful, uh, but at least one of or two of the symptoms that might be maybe the most central. And the idea is maybe we can intervene on that. Uh, and, and, and there are now some ongoing studies that actually examine that. What if you personalize intervention based on these individual networks? Is this indeed then more effective than what we already give them at this moment? Now, I give you, uh, I, you are now confronted with an example of a study um, that we work on. It's the Stay Fine study, and there we personalize now, we, we developed a supermarket of apps and each app targets a different mechanism. So, for instance, one is focused on exposure, the other is behavioral activation, the other is cognitive restructuring, the other is positive effects. Now, anyhow, and then based on individual symptom networks in combination with a sort of psychological passport that is made together with all kind of um, yeah questionnaires we use many times people get an personalized advice to um to take one or the other um uh, app or a couple of apps for instance if sleep is more central 
then they are advised to at least start with the sleep app in combination with some others. I have to be honest, there is also shared decision making. So if someone says, yeah, this is the automatized advice, but actually I really do not want to work on my sleep, then they are allowed to let go. Uh, and this is actually, this study is conducted in young people between 30 and 21 that have experienced anxiety disorders and depression before. And the main goal here is to prevent relapse. We still have to wait and see whether this is effective. So um, actually, um, uh, young people really like it. Therapists really like it. This one is uh, supervised or guided by, by peers who uh, have lived experience. They also like it. But yeah, in the end, it's nice they like it. It's important they like it. But we still have to wait and see whether this indeed offers more effective treatment than what's out there or than no personalization. So this is just to give you some idea of what is going on in the, at the moment. And we have to wait and see. You could also target based on, for instance, group networks, networks, you could target on a group level. So say, for instance, based on social media, you could make, and that's quite easy to do, a network of young people and how they're connected <clears throat> with each other. But you notice that they actually not have face-to-face -face contact in any way. You could think of, for instance, finding a way to connect this also to people in the neighborhoods or to activities in the neighborhood. And other examples are, of course, school interventions and family interventions that are quite effective, but also quite time consuming. So maybe we could do that in a different way via the route of social media. And another way, and we could also target on a society level. So say if it's possible to have influence on our policy makers and to, for instance, stop in the Netherlands, we had a lot of school closures and we also saw an indication, a clear indication that it resulted in an increase in, uh, in mental health uh, problems and conditions. So say if we can create models that can influence policy makers and, they, and that they do not do this measure anymore, but other levels, it might have a very positive impact on a large level. Or say if we use on a society level social media in a different way than it's done at the moment, and we use a knowledge we have in clinical psychology to work, for instance, on cognitive restructuring. Or, and this is not say, but it's already there, what about e-health? We do already have e-health. And evil e-health, okay, it's mostly focused on the individual. But still, the accessibility actually can be spread on a societal level. Yeah? So you can target a really large group with e-health. And if there's some type of guidance, then actually it's quite effective. Now, I was really struck by this, um, this article in the, in the New York, New York Times a, a while ago. And um, it said, science plays the long game, but people have mental issues now. And um, yeah, and uh, these journalists actually wondered why researchers have placed so little emphasis on helping people in distress today. I would argue that science and clinical practice can go hand in hand. We still need research to study the effect. And although there's really exciting stuff going on by applying complex systems to the mental health, including networks and all kinds of other stuff that is going on, we still have to wait and see whether indeed this brings us more effective treatment that we have at this moment or effective treatments that are easily accessible at a, at a large scale. So that's why I would like to make the claim that we still do need research, even though there are indeed, and this is long before COVID that this article was written, that there are many people who are suffering heavily. So we have to focus on doing it better. I want to almost end to give you a bit of a positive note 
on a macro level, societal level, I think we do have a lot to offer. There is now in the meantime, even in lower middle income countries, evidence for the effect of online interventions that are usually guided um, are the, the, the effect sizes are indeed uh, yeah, bigger if you guide it. So I think that's recommendable. But even if you guide it by less specialized people, it seems to do the work. And this is a, a, a meta-analysis um, that was published in the Lancet Psychiatry in which Song Fang Fu did a meta-analysis on, on the systematic evidence in lower middle income countries for all mental health conditions of online intervention. And she found like good evidence for treatment of, of uh, depression and, and um, addiction, and also some evidence for anxiety disorders and even PTSD, although we need some more studies on that, I have to admit on that. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is Another thing we have to offer is that we actually could think about task sharing. We could actually train, for instance, lay counselor in combination with all kind of online interventions to do the treatments because the prevalence is that high. It's, of course, important to think about other ways of reaching a lot of people. And uh, uh, Reta Arjadi did a randomized controlled trial in, in Indonesia in several in several islands and 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 there we developed a behavioral activation online intervention partly automatized and this was guided by lay counselors and only a bit of supervision by clinical psychologists and we we studied this in a randomized control trial in depressive disorders so not depressive problems but disorders and we did find good effects on lowering depression, but also 50% higher chance of remission that also sustained over time. So are we ready yet? No, but I think we could also think about offering our knowledge to actually facilitate task sharing to less trained uh, people so that more people who are suffering from mental health conditions are actually treated. So overall, from complexity and complex systems, I think we should go and could go to simple interventions. The fact that it's complex and a dancing system and many factors and la 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 doesn't mean that there is no chance for simple interventions. I think we already proved within the field of clinical psychology that there are actually quite of a lot of relatively simple psychological interventions that are effective to targeting uh, most mental health conditions. But now is the opportunity to increase the effect, to develop interventions that are preferable, as simple as possible, but also as attractive as possible so that people actually do it. And I think we have a responsibility, but also we have the capability to make it as accessible as needed. Now, I want to thank you for your attention and of course all the full research group and of course also the center for urban mental health there are many many people there working on it if you're interested please have a look at uh, at the link and um, if it's not in the chat possible please contact me for any kind of question papers or whatever thank you hello thank you very Thank you very much, Claudie, for your uh, for your fascinating talk. Now we will have a short break to allow us uh, to join with uh, our panelists. So please don't go anywhere. Um, have a coffee or tea and come back uh, in a few minutes. Um, and thank you very much uh, to the audience for listening us live and for posting questions and comments on the chat. See you soon, very shortly. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back again uh, to uh, the second part of our webinar uh, where we will, well, I won't, but our amazing panelists will be debating um, following on Claudie's um, talk. So once again, to remind you, we have here Professor Cristina Botella from Spain. We have uh, Dr. Maria Carecla from uh, University of Cyprus in Cyprus. Then we have Professor Eiko Wright and then from Leiden, Netherlands. And then, of course, we have Claudie Bokting from Netherlands and our wonderful host, Winfried. So, Winfried, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, friendly words. Uh, welcome again. And first, I want to thank Claudie for her really stimulating talk. I think it's so important to have people like you broaden our vision uh, and, and to, to bring our attention uh, not only to the very little things we are working every day with, but to do to the broad connections in our societies. This was really very stimulating. And this brings us to the topic of our uh, panel discussion. Uh, this is uh, how to develop new concepts of mental health that stimulate better, more successful interventions. And there is a lot of movement away from the traditional counting of psychopathological symptoms, but in the direction of, uh, of investigating trans diagnostic factors or uh, mechanisms of mental disorders. And uh, I know that uh, Maria and Christina uh, have published on that and they are, uh, I'm pretty sure that you will present stimulating ideas on that. And we also have Eiko coming from uh, Leiden in, in the Netherlands who has published a lot on uh, using network models to bring our understanding of mental disorders on a more empirical basis, uh, which is something I think which is really necessary. So, uh, Marta has already introduced our speakers, therefore I would suggest we, can, we directly start with the discussion. And uh, I, I would say, uh, I would suggest that uh, our panelists start with a comment uh, what do you think how should we continue with developing concepts on mental disorders on mental health what would be an improvement and at the very end it should also help to design new interventions or more effective interventions so uh, we have no defined list yet who wants to start so i would say let's do it uh, on, on my list the first is christina botella from spain Welcome, Christina, and Thank you. you're invited to start. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate Professor Riff for organizing this excellent webinar. I think it will be very, very useful for all EACLIP members and all clinicians interested in treatment. And also, I would like to congratulate our speaker and our president, Claudi Botkin. Not only, not only, yes, for this excellent presentation, an inspiring and very impressive presentation, but also for your impressive research career. In fact, I think the fundamental idea you have defending here, combining complex uh, complexity and simplicity, uh, has been latent in your work for many years. Yes, today I think it's possible to say uh, that your research work and fundamentally the results of your impressive and many and a lot of different randomized control trial and meta-analysis confirm that you were and you are in the right track. I strongly believe that your results as a whole will have a clear impact on general clinical recommendations and in the future will benefit many patients suffering from recurrent, recurrent depression of other psychological problems. Good, really congratulations, Claudia. <laughs> and taking advantage of the fact that you are today with us, I would like to ask you some questions. They refer to several aspects. What type of psychological intervention should we use? When 
should we use them, how they could be delivered, and who could or should apply them. I would like very much if we can uh, have some some answers at the end of the of the talk or at the end of the of the <clears throat> of the meeting. Starting with the kind of intervention we need, in your presentation, um, you were more moving from complexity to simple interventions. You have defended we need interventions that are as simple as possible, and I agree, as attractive as possible, and as flexible as needed. I would like to remember here in this context the, the seminal paper by Catherine and Blaise in 2011 and in 2015, explaining that, in, in his opinion, the characteristic should have the, the psychological interventions we need in order to overcome the one-to-one -one model, to apply one clinician, one patient, one clinician, one couple, one clinician, and that is going to complexity. We need, inter that, well, no, no, Gadin, uh, 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 he says, we need intervention that reach everyone in need, scalable, the capacity to be applied of a large scale or even a larger scale than individual therapy, uh, relatively cost eh? uh, compared to usual treatment, convenient, that is it possible to be integrated in people's everyday life, uh, the possibility to expand, eh? to, to, to reach much more uh, uh, scalable, uh, uh, to reach much more people, to, to be applied in the, or to bring the interventions to everyday settings. Uh, also, you say, and I agree, acceptable uh, uh, to, to consumers, that is pot potential clients, potential uh, patients, and uh, uh, the therapist. Flexible. That is the different ways of deliver these kind of interventions, and also in your meta-analysis uh, in Indonesia, you use non-professional workforce, and this is crucial in order to be able to get everyone in need. I would like we were able to talk about this possible characteristic that should have our interventions, but. Before I I, <laughs> I finish my my initial intervention, I have a, I have a curiosity, uh, uh, Claudie, because in your in your uh, specific in your specific uh, preventive cognitive therapy, you explain in your papers this is a this is a a, a specific cognitive therapy uh, developed to prevent relapse in recurrent depression, but differs the traditional protocols. And I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to, to read the global protocol, but for your description, I, I recognize you are including positive affect strategies, no? Strategies to, 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 to improve positive affect. And I would like to to, to know your opinion about the, the, the work done by Michel Krask and her, and, her, and her positive affect treatment in order to improve anhedonia and in depression. Uh, a, a, an intervention, she says, designed to specifically target deficits, deficits in reward sensitivity. Okay? And this is also related and I finish here with the possibility of using, uh, uh, that is taking into account the, the important uh, comorbidity we can find in, in the mental, uh, in different mental disorders. What is the possibility or your opinion about the possibility of using transdiagnostic treatment protocols? You know, that you have different modules, people can choose or can use, or the clinician can recommend depending of the in order to to be able to to 
provide uh, strategies and provide uh, 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 techniques to the patient in order to confront in the future, in the future, much Christina, more. Christina, sorry to interrupt you, uh, yeah. but uh, for the sake of all uh, panelists, I, I would suggest that we try to keep the introductory statement uh, brief and that we have time left for, for an okay, uh, right. exchange of ideas. But you ask all the crucial questions uh, that we might not solve tonight, but uh, that are really important to, to be addressed. And I'm looking forward to the comments of the others. So Claudia is preparing to give us the answer to all these complicated questions. But before that, <laughs> I would uh, suggest that we continue with Maria and uh, your introductory comment uh, on how to proceed and what are the concepts we should follow in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Winfried. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for organizing such an amazing webinar. And thank you, Claudie, for an amazing uh, presentation and for all the work that you have done in this area. It really speaks to my heart and the things that I'm passionate and interested about it, uh, uh, in this area. Um, Christina, you mentioned um, a, a little bit this uh, idea or question that Paul had posed in 1969 about what treatment for whom, under what conditions, and so on. And um, this this brought to me, um, to my mind, uh, this kind of like newer question posed recently by Hoffman and Hayes in 2019, extending this question, what core biopsychosocial processes should be targeted with this client, given this goal in this situation, and how can they most efficiently and effectively be changed? Um, so I just wanted to pose that there as well, that we take this together into consideration um, and to start exactly, you know, examining some of these things that both Claudia and Christina pointed to, that maybe we need to start moving towards targeting mechanisms in research and practice, like moving away from the idea of just, you know, targeting symptoms and syndromes and signs and all these things that we've been um, kind of like confined as well in our, uh, you know, conceptualizations of, of conditions and uh, how to intervene and start to examine uh, the events in context, like the both the historical, situational context, uh, collecting data in multiple ways across all these different levels and, and modes. Um, and across time, I heard before uh, in the break, Aiko was mentioning, you know, collecting EMA data for two years. And I think that's so amazing and impressive. And, you know, this is the kinds of things that we can start to look at, you know, these kinds of, you know, behaviors and difficulties across time uh, to be able to start deciphering and and to put things like exactly into, into context. So examining this events unfolding over time with more intensive type analyses and testing it across all these multiple analytical levels. So I'm I'm really excited by all this work being done and all the work that Claudie already uh, presented to us. And I look forward to discussing all these also questions that Christina posed. Um, and I'll pass the floor on to the next speaker. Thank you, Maria, for this clear plea for better focusing on mechanisms, on, on personalized approaches. Uh, I think this, is, this comes from the heart of most of us. Uh, so thank you. I want to hand over to, to Aiko, uh, because maybe you bring another uh, perspective to, to mental disorders that has not been mentioned yet, and uh, maybe a little bit with Gloris, uh approach of complexity. So I'm uh, excited to, to, to listen to your ideas about uh, future concepts of mental disorders. Thanks, uh, Winfried. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very humbled. It feels like it was yesterday when I was a student and I was reading Claudie's papers, and now I'm here to discuss um, dis discuss with her uh, complexity science. And I'm, it's uh, fantastic. Um, I'm not clinically trained, right? So I um, 
did a PhD in psychology broadly. I'm a researcher. I did internships with, with some patients and so forth. But unlike most of you, I'm not clinically trained. I'm an outsider here. And so maybe an outsider's perspective is helpful a little. Um, because when I read papers in graduate school, everything seemed so oversimplified to me. And Claudia highlighted this in her talk. Most research papers talk about one risk factor or one disorder. And it seems so bizarre to me growing up in, in academia that people would think so oversimplified. Right? There's a lot of recent work that most of you will have read. Um, the, the one egregious example that I use in my papers is an ADHD paper from 2017 on neuroimaging, where the authors quote in the abstract that, AD, that they find systematic differences between people with ADHD and healthy controls in uh, neuroimaging, therefore ADHD is a disorder of the brain. Like these sort of statements you see everywhere in science. And then, you know, I grew up, I became a postdoc and I started talking to clinicians. I started talking to people who wrote these papers and they all said, no, 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 no. We believe in, into the biopsychosystem, the social approach. And as Claudia mentioned, right? Um, she, they interviewed so many people, all of them said, no, no, it's a really complex world. And so I only learned then that there's this divide between how clinicians practice psychotherapy, how psychiatrists often practice uh, pharmacology, and how we write research papers. And that was kind of odd to me to, to see this divide. Um, and I think we're not doing people justice, and I think it's harmful to oversimplify. I think we've told ourselves stories in the literature uh, at times, and I, 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 I see that as a fundamental barrier to progress. And so um, Claudia's solution that I share is to embrace complexity as much as we can. Um, and so maybe my way forward, Winfried, I would propose um, for treatments is that if you embrace this idea of complexity of systems, of networks more, all of a sudden you open up an entire library of areas that have worked on this before, from physics to ecology, to environmental sciences, to cancer biology and so forth. And many of these fields have developed tools, methods, theories that that tend to replicate across different areas. And so I think that gives us new levers to understand mental health as well, because it's quite possible that some of these methods, tools, levers, interventions and ideas will replicate or work out in mental health interventions as well. And so that is my question for Cloudy, basically. What I mean, you know, I could talk about early warning signals, critical slowing down, and so forth. Some of the keywords that, that some of you might have heard about, I can elaborate on this further later perhaps, but I would. Uh, my question for Claudia would be what, what of these tools, measures, approaches, theories, she thinks are most promising to possibly develop new, new interventions moving forward? Thank you, Aiko. Claude is nodding, so uh, we are looking forward to, to uh, listening to all the answers to these many questions that have been posed to you. <laughs> but we don't want to over challenge you. <laughs> uh, but uh, what, what's your idea about all these questions, Claude? Yeah, many ideas. Uh, yeah, and first of all, I'd like to thank you for your overly kind words. It feels like um, we can go to my funeral now. So no, <laughs> it's the end of the career. And I could, I'm not that old. Like, no, no, I perceive myself, by the way, as an intervention. Uh, I'm interested, what can we do to make sure that people do not need to suffer severely from mental health conditions or not so long or do not get it back? So I perceive myself as an intervention developer, researcher, clinician. And the only reason why I'm into this is because we actually, yeah, you have to go into the fundamentals because no one believes what we're actually wrote down for, for decades and decades. It's an oversimplification. We have endless amounts of research lines that that for, but you could say on the other hand we probably need that also so we needed uh, uh, decades of specialization to be able to get next to get to next steps so it's also a bit of a ritual to be able to have hope and get to some kind of knowledge and from that on we think okay how to move forward now and i think personally to start with the positive side it's really, really cool that we do have effective treatments. 
it's really that let's start with that so if you talk to medical specialists they they most of them say whoa that's really impressive so you study that in randomized control trials and there are control groups for them that's very important and you still find an effect sort of half of the people and still okay we can debate on that and on control groups and anyhow but this is also on an individual level that that patients actually report so let's start with that it's not that we do not have nothing this simplified approach actually brought us a lot of knowledge and also the knowledge that we can make a difference for a relatively large group. We are not too good in the prevention stuff, by the way, in preventing uh, common mental health conditions. So we're trying and there is some music here and there, but we have to do better on that. But overall, the treatment for most common mental health, we're doing relatively good the only thing is like the discoveries have been done mostly oh, oh, by the way not by theory work and so on although i know i i, I have to be a bit um yeah um, a bit careful now but most of them were actually coincidence we we found out not we our ancestors found this out coincidentally, for instance, with behavioral activation and even cognitive behavioral therapy. And then later on, we thought of the theoretical background and then worked on it. And then here and there, we found some, some evidence. And the same holds, by the way, for more the psychodynamic oriented or client centered or whatever. So, yeah. Anyhow, so I just wanted to make the case that also the simplification that we've done for a long, long time and the specialization also brought something. But now I think it's really the time to zoom out and be aware we also did not have a lot of options to zoom out. I had a bit of a strange hobby for a long time. It was a it started a long time. I, I think about 15 years ago and in and, and this hobby uh, so so I went uninvitedly to to I uh, actually I imposed myself on on conferences on computational science and computer science and all these kind of guys who are especially men there and I, I actually begged them to have only a little bit of a talk on mental health and and actually there was only it was one message take us as a big data or complex system problem and so on. And then I have to be honest, like I went there maybe nah, 15 years so say I say uh, eight times or so. And the first six times I, I, they accepted me to give a talk and, and it didn't bring anything. People were not, not literally laughing at me, but they, they, they were polite and then I went back and nothing happens. But in the last years, it really changed. So also those 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 technical oriented people were very interested in mental health, but also collaborating on this. So what I'm saying is there are now former opportunities to also embrace the complexity. And we do have more opportunity opportunity to get a bit of a glimpse what's actually going on in the wild in daily life. And there, of course, are a lot of problems, So, but that's really different. And there is more and more methodolo methodology. So now we are able to embrace it a, mit, a bit. So now, and now what are the most promising tools? I think the most promising one might be on macro level. So for instance, and now we're, I don't know, uh, but, but we're all, of course, we all faced we're not there yet, but we're, we're, we're in the middle of this COVID pandemic. And that goes up and up and down. And many governments invested to create some kind of predictive models, what to do best. So, for instance, in the Netherlands, we have only limited capacity of, of uh, the IC uh, places in hospital. So they used models, simulation models to get a bit of a bit of a predictive model to find out what if we have an evening clock, what happens to the capacity in the hosp hospital. Now, this my now, and my clue is these kind of things we could also do for the impact of policy level, policy making on mental health. 
And then we're sort of talking the same language. And then we could think about what if we intervene here and there. There is a famous example in Iceland where they invested on, in, in the whole country because there was a huge problem on, uh, with addiction. And they invested in Iceland in, in, in free sports and the cultural life and so on. And I know it's still debated, but there seems to be good, mu good effects there in preventing addiction in young people. Of course, we have to wait and see. We're not there yet. And Iceland is not the whole of Europe, but it's an example of using knowledge from the clinical psychology, trying to use this knowledge to get to public campaigning, but also all kind of policy on a social level and maybe on a higher macro level. So I think there is a lot of music there. And for now, yeah, I do work also on some studies on personalization, and it does make sense as a clinician because I think every clinician will say, I always personalize because it's impossible to, to, to do something with a patient that this person thinks that doesn't make sense. So for us, it's, yeah, we always personalize, but we do not do this on empirical grounds. So it would be very cool if we are able to do that on empirical grounds, but only if treatment is more effective. So I'm also too much of a researcher to know, so that I, I, I don't know, for instance, in the in the world, in the cancer, in, in if you look at the progress in cancer and personalization, right? There is progress in, in that um, most, some of, no, not most, some of the cancer treatments, chemotherapy can be personalized and this way it's more acceptable for them so you are less sick. So your quality of life is a little bit better. But when I talk to the specialist on cancer, they say, yeah, but we didn't. We were not able to prolong lives. So and that is a bit sobering because, yeah, I, so now to sum up. Yes, uh, I do think that personalization might be a logical thing to do. I think that most therapists already do that. It does make sense if we do, could do that instead of on intuition on empirical, empirical grounds, because a lot of the clinical intuition is sometimes not always the, way, the good way. Eh? We have some evidence on that. So, But we still have to wait and see whether indeed this brings more effective treatments. And then effective, I don't care about what you call to be effective that could be the quality of life or that people think it's important to go back to work or able to feel love again that's really up to the individual but i think that's a uh, very important and then maybe the next point that maria and also christina mentions yeah we have to know when what by whom it has to be flexible it has to be real time uh, it has to be as little as necessary but you have to scale up at the moment that it's necessary it has to be something that has to be there lifelong because many of the mental health conditions unluckily are something that they, they return and they relapse and this is not only for depression but also for addiction and many others um i think what what a lot of the work that is done currently with help of, of with the backbone of complex systems they are actually dealing with these issues not only what to do at this moment but also uh, they also try to incorporate the timing over time so it could be possible for instance within one person that in the end we find interventions that might be effective for this moment but not in half a year when you're also dealing with a divorce so that is actually quite exciting, right? I think there is music there that given that we can study this in a different way, we might do discoveries that actually can help people to adapt the interventions according to what is happening at that moment and not only in their environment, but also internally. Mm. And um, another thing you talked about um, also, um, yeah, um, yeah, well, I'm sorry, I have to check it again because maybe it's my interpretation. Now, yeah, what tools are the most promising? I think actually the current momentary assessments 
apps and so on, I think they are not very promising, to be honest. I think for interventions they are, but not for monitoring. Most people are not able to do this on the long term. And if they do, they are really the outliers. They are probably, yeah, probably the most uh, obsessive compulsive people in the whole population, right? So I, 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 I talk to everyone who stopped the momentary, so the app studies, the momentary assessment studies in my previous, everyone who stopped, I, I actually asked them, so what is the reason for you to stop? And I, I remember vividly one person, yeah, I'm reconstructing my bathroom with some helpers and, and, and then 10 times a day, I get a beep to say how I feel. And I thought, yeah, indeed. If you would do that, then you're absolutely crazy. So, but so I see this as an in-between step, and I think pretty soon we will find like very probably more simple proxies of um, yeah early predictors of where we're going or where we, what we what we're feeling later on, and that is really cool because then we can. When we can probably uh, develop automatized interventions that alert you at a very, very early stage, even before that your emotions actually took over. So I think this is really an accomplishment that we cannot do in the face-to-face -face sessions. Uh, but still, okay, we have to wait and see. We need research to find out what it is indeed brings the music. Uh Really, I agree with you, Claudie, about the uh, ecological momentary assessment could be um, boring or, or, or very, very bad. But I think if we obtain a lot of data in a passive way, how many calls, how many uh, messages, uh, where I go, uh, what's the weather around me, uh, it was the situation where I live, I, I walk or I don't walk, I stay at home. Many, many, many of this data could be really very useful to, to, to understand uh, if, uh, if a, um, a bad moment is approaching and uh, what's the relation, you know? Uh, I yeah. think this passive, passive uh, uh, way of obtaining relevant data of the context and the day by day uh, uh, of the patient could be really useful. Uh, obviously, and very, very useful if we check uh, the patient needs something, we can provide them a, 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 a short intervention, momentary intervention in order to help them. But uh, for, for assessment, I think uh, could be also very, very useful in a passive way yeah no i agree with you like uh like wearing uh it could be uh, like you like everyone has a phone so a lot of passive data can be uh did. but still yeah we have to wait and see eh, for what is really meaningful information so we just retrieve the data from um also based on an app of uh affective items over time and and it it had, didn't have any clinical meaning later on. I was surprised, although there were high there were there were a lot of individual differences. It is the second time in the next so so that means what so the individual differences are larger than the meaning the individual meaning for that something will happen soon after, like for instance, a depressive relapse or an anxiety. So we have to wait and see, but I do agree it's it's a very good idea to invest in uh, examining these proxies like passive data and so, because that that there might be music there. So I think we have a huge research agenda that might have immediate effects on early signals when something is going wrong and that you actually can maybe partly automatize intervene on it. I see Ico raising the hand. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the EMA and the feasibility, Claudia. I uh, share your concerns there, of course. Um, we've done this in a few clinical populations now, people with psychosis even, and it's incredibly difficult for them, of course. Uh, to keep the focus, to maintain the concentration, to do this multiple times a day or even once a day. Um, so I really see the promise here in uh, predicting future onset personally. 
because then you can do it with reasonably healthy populations um, who are not functionally impaired too much, who have the capacity maybe to carry out these tasks a little easier. And um, so I, maybe that's not intervention, that's prevention. But I think EMA is a more, more likely candidate to be a successful tool there than compared to monitoring, as you say, which really is burdensome. And if we think of these disorders as recurrent and severe and chronic, we can't monitor somebody you know, for 20 years using their smartphone, at least not with, um, with EMA data. Um, so passive sensing will come in there and so forth. One short other comment, um, uh, Claudia knows that in my lab we're doing this right now, and I just wanted to add how much information we get from qualitative EMA data. So we're asking to see people just a couple very simple questions. Many of them will write five, six, seven words about current activity or with whom they are right now, or simply what's your worst thing today that happened or your best thing last week that happened. And why it'll be challenging to analyze this for obvious reasons, it's remarkable how much information about a, a person's life we get from both you know, standard quantitative EMA data, but also qualitative EMA data in people granted who can do this two, three, four times a day for a period of multiple months. Um, yeah, a good point. Yeah. yeah, I think, I can I respond to this just briefly because I really like this part because I just wanted to add, like sometimes we 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 think of really cool stuff, right? And it's technology, technology and la la la. But, but I think the good comparison is actually compare it to simply ask one question, how do you feel, for instance, <laughs> and see, does it do better than that? And if this is the case, then you then it might be something if you indeed are able then to prevent onset with, with some interventions, right? So I think there's a huge uh, research agenda with very good ideas. So I think as, as a community, we, we really need to, 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 to yeah, to go on stage and really ask for really large, large, large funding to work together on this, uh, because we have to make a difference for individuals and not only in the curate, but also in, of course, in the primary prevention part. There's another thing I would like to add, Aiko. I think that EMA or momentary assessment with an app actually does have something to offer to offer that we didn't have before because you might be able to predict what will happen that day or the day after. Whereas many of the epidemiological studies predicted that, some, that, that something happens in two or 20 or 30 years. And that's not so interesting because we're quite good in, 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 in we know the risk groups. We don't need more studies on who is the risk group or not. We know. It's very easy, and if you're very lazy, just focus on the low socioeconomic uh, status group, and then you have it. So I think there, but but that you are able to predict when or that something is happening pretty soon, that's very meaningful. For instance, when you're talking about a suicide attempt or suicide, clinicians want don't want to know whether this is someone that commits suicide in 20 years. No, you want to know. Am I safe to let this people go home? This person go home, uh, and is this person still alive next week? So, and that is something I, I really, I really think there is some music there as well, and there is also some evidence there already that is it's possible. Yeah. Just to add one it's, sentence, um, as Claudia knows, we're currently building an early warning uh, system to predict depression onset in in students. So this is exactly what we're going to do, uh, Claudia and I. I agree that um, we can't predict things far into the future at the moment using EMA data, but uh, the next week perhaps there's strong signals that we don't capture with these baseline variables, the broader ones, uh, the, the daily mood, um, daily sleep, daily activity, GPS plays a huge role there. Sorry, Maria. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, this is really interesting. Everything we're, we're discussing here and uh, just to add, uh, agree with everything you guys have said and just to add a parameter here, I think the, the value of, of EMA and some of this way of, of approaching it is when we combine it um, with, uh, you know, and, and truly conduct like multi-model 
cross-level type of research where um, some of the things that we've been playing around with uh, in recent years has been with, you know, recording the psychophysiological aspects of how individuals respond and combining that with, you know, some of this passive data you get from like cell phones, like the GPS signals and where they were and, you know, how they move about and, you know, how does that correlate? We, we have a really cool study with um, a GPS along with my colleague Andrew Gloucester in Switzerland where uh, we looked at inpatients and outpatients movements uh, tracked with the GPS and we found that those individuals who were um, moving more and, you know, having, you know, more uh, kind of like wide network of, of places to go to were engaging in more like values-based activities were the ones that fared better than the ones that had a more limited. So uh, like starting to combine data and, 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 you know, getting this information from different levels, whether it's psychophysiological um, self-report with by EMA or, or otherwise, uh, some of the passive information we can just collect from individuals and bringing all this plethora of information together may start to give us some of these clues that we need either for prediction or uh, for intervening at the time when when uh, we need it or when um, it can help the individual. So really, really interesting stuff happening in all of our labs, I think. Thank you, Maria, and, and to all of you for your comments. They are really great. And uh, I want just to add on, on Maria, uh, because uh, I think we have so complex statistical methods. I've read some of ICO's papers. It's hard to understand how complex and intelligent they are. And we have smartphones, they are so intelligent. And then we use the bottleneck of asking simple questions in, with a questionnaire. Uh, this is sound, this looks a little bit like median age of, of uh, getting information from people. So should we be more creative? And Maria suggested some parts, but I think more simpler, it's, it's maybe sometimes just uh, asking for a voice message. Then you get the voice, you get the information of, of the words, uh, but you also get the vibrations that uh, the, the tremolos of, of the voice and so on. You can. I think we should be much more creative in, in collecting very different uh, information, pictures, a little video shot, uh, something that goes closer to the real life of the people instead of asking back depression inventory item 17 uh, several times a day. So, uh, would you agree to that? And you are the expert, so I'm just asking questions. So I can add a sentence here. Um, I just finished up the proofs for a paper like before this meeting on uh, on uh, new ways to measure depression. And that's exactly what you described, Winfried. If we take this complexity, this biopsychosocial angle, we need to understand that all of a sudden this epistemologically prioritized position of symptoms goes away. We stop just looking at symptoms. There's really no reason from a perspective that, that most of us hold to only look at symptoms and clinicians wouldn't do that but we still use it for tracking treatment progress most rcts i would say 99 percent of rcts use symptom measures as primary outcomes but what about what about social systems of people are they not equally relevant what about activity people's ability to go out people's ability to go to, to work or have a, a sexual relationship with somebody else aren't these at least equally important than than concentration problems or impairment or sorry sadness or depression so I think from, from this angle of systems, the, the, yeah, this idea of only focusing on the back depression inventory, as you say, um, it looks silly even. And, and there are many more uh, aspects of depression that, that ought to be measured and monitored and intervened upon. I think. Yeah. Now, that is exactly what clinicians do. Eh? That's why uh, sometimes the, 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 the start of the therapy is a bit long because they explore not only symptomatology, but also the impact on all levels of life and the development over time and so on. Um, 
I, I have a more fundamental problem. I actually think these are not symptoms. So, for instance, feeling sad is not a symptom. It's 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 a, it's what is it? It's an effect. It's it's. Uh, but somehow we decided it's a symptom. Uh, sleeping problem is also not a symptom. Eh? So so maybe we should. I, I know these are the characteristics that we sort of decided long time ago that these are the components of depression. And I, I do think in a way we have a good, there are some good reasons why we should do that. But in essence, it's not a symptom at the moment that we say we are going to explore a network of symptoms. No, that wording alone is already very strange, especially since most of the networks are done in people that actually do not have a mental health condition. But still, we call them symptoms. So, and, and and if you're really serious about this, the DSM is, there's a lot of debate on that, but they actually say it's not a symptom. It should count as zero if there is not a major impact on functioning. And functioning means not only your work, but also your private life and so on. So there is also a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy and we are keep on saying the same things time and time again. But even that horrible system as the classification system of DSM actually told, no, you're not allowed to call this a symptom or even count this as a symptom if there is no major impact on daily life. So in a way, we created a system on its own. Uh, and I really like your um, your um, yeah already like your paper. I'm really looking forward to reading it, uh, Aiko. But I think actually we should also stop talking about symptoms because these are experiences that all of us have. So what is it then that it's uh, a mental health condition? And this holds for many many mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. And the same I think, Claudia and, and all regarding the, the strategies, the, the techniques you will use, because uh, we have a, a mindset about, for instance, depression, no? It's a chronic condition. It's a recurrent condition. Uh, what about the possibility of changing this? Eh? Uh, 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 to modify the static norms about depression, this is a chronic and recurrent condition, I cannot change, would say the patient, to more flexible or dynamic norms. It is yes. possible to treat in a more effective way depression. I can change. For okay. this reason, I think it is very important you explain, as you say also, uh, uh, to, 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 to be in contact with other disciplines. I think social psychology could be an excellent candidate. Gregory Walton and uh, uh, wise strategies for, uh, for very small, specific, and simple strategies could be really useful for mm -hmm. promoting change. I think uh, we should, for in our team, uh, uh, at the moment we are conducting a, a, a project, is Rosa Banos is the IP, and mm -hmm. we're developing developing wise interventions, very short and simple wise intervention from the lab, from the lab uh, to be tested. And if they work, then we can add this specific and simple wise intervention to our uh, clinical protocols. In order to change, for instance, the policy makers, we could design a, a simple uh, yeah. strategy to change the mind of the policy makers to change the, the family of the depression uh, patient to change the, the 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 way the patient confronts life. This is, in our opinion, is important to to try to develop new, simple but very uh, uh, possible and effective uh, uh, techniques. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I actually think, for instance, if you look at the work in lower middle income countries, for instance, by the WHO, 
the World Health Organization, and they actually did already a long time a great job in trying to isolate the most simple interventions and then testing it out and doing proper trials and so on and see. And actually, then like in lower middle income uh, countries, they don't have all these specialists doing all the diagnosing stuff and so on. So they do it per definition, uh, transdiagnostically, and they are actually quite good results with relatively simple interventions like behavioral activation. It's so it's a very good candidate, but also problem solving, for instance. Mm -hmm. And it seems to do the work for actually uh, most conditions. So so I tot totally agree. Um, while listening to you, I I, I did. Re Think oh, you were talking about transdiagnostic. Eh? You had a, a, a question about the transdiagnostic uh, interventions. I actually think, but 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 maybe I'm now a bit too pessimistic. But I think actually the most transdiagnostic um, intervention out there is CBT. It's almost boring if you look at the evidence. Like every, it's almost like, of course, in the meantime, we specialized and we have all these specialized protocols. But overall, there seems to be the case that most interventions, as studied within the package of CBT, actually, they seem to do the work. So I think it's nothing new, the transdiagnostic part. The only new thing is maybe that we give up thinking that only the specialized packages do the work. Although I do think for some conditions it's necessary to do it slightly differently. For instance, response prevention. Yeah, that might be for some conditions very essential and less for others. But I think... Yeah, uh, there was the debate last time at this webinar. It was a great debate between uh, uh, Stefan Hoffman and others. And, and one of them said, yeah, but where's the evidence that is indeed more effective than what we already have, for instance, in this case, CBT or other psychotherapeutic orient orientations. And that's we still have to wait and see. So personally, I don't see any innovation from tra transdiagnostic interventions because we're actually in there already for 40 years or more since the 70s. So, yeah, that's a bit my my. Uh, so I think we have to do better. But that's very personal. <laughs> Claudia, I think the the problem there was that you know a lot of the protocols developed, uh, you know, utilizing CBT was CBT for this condition, CBT for this other condition. Exactly. And it, it made it seem like it's very kind of like compartmentalized. So I think in reality, if CBT is a transdiagnostic approach, but I think kind of like the newer thinking is to move towards what you were alluding to earlier as well, like this more like kind of like more process-based, like what, Hoffman is proposing recently, along with Hayes, uh, and, and also targeting the specific mechanisms rather than, you know, looking at conditions or syndromes or, you know, clusters of symptoms together. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, I think that's where things have, you know, become problematic because then it led to like this cookbook book approaches that, you know, I just go find this protocol and then apply it and it yeah, should completely work. agree completely agree but and and uh, I'm, I'm it could also be the case that it doesn't matter where you hit the system so it could be the case that we're focusing all the time on these specific mechanisms that we have to target right uh, and then there is the music but if you if you look at at all the studies that have that have been done on the evidence for working mechanisms. Eh? It's still a bit, okay, there are a lot of methodological issues. So you could say, okay, we couldn't demonstrate it because almost all studies are underpowered to actually find this specific work working mechanism of an intervention. So that is one route you could explain, or you could take the other route and say, maybe it does work specific interventions, but it doesn't work via the mechanisms that we actually hypothesize. So maybe it's not so important. Maybe it's important that somewhere you have this, this system with all these kind of problems that someone is facing with mental health problems, and somehow you have to 
you have to change this system and it, it maybe it's irrelevant where you hit it and um, is it just so so and maybe we have to think about other options there as well and this is something in complex systems they discuss a lot yeah. Um, and, 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 and I'm not saying that this is the route, but it's it might be something we have to consider time and time again. Maybe we have to get away from the idea that we find the ideal mechanism to target. Maybe there it could be that there is not the music. Yeah, I'm not sure. Eh? I don't know. But I think this is a challenging thought. I would I would agree that uh, it's uh, it's an ideal to think about simplified and, and isolated mechanisms, and uh, Claudio, your, uh, your your words they point to to Ico's idea of of a network. So if it's a network, then you can change it by targeting different nodes, and uh, then the whole interplay of the network might change. So this this would also explain a lot, but. Uh, sorry, Christina, I interrupted you because I think we are approaching the end of our uh, discussion, which is very stimulating. So I would say uh, I, I would give all of you the word again, maybe to, to summarize, not to summarize, but to express a kind of wish for the future of the development of concepts of clinical psychology. Uh, so it's we had in, in the clinical psychology in Europe we had a Christmas edition and we asked you and others to express a wish for the new year and many of you did so if you did read it you can read again uh, our editorial so now it's time again to express some wishes uh, but now it's more the time to express a wish for for the progress of our field so maybe Claudia I, I uh, give the word to you first because you had our introductory talk, so uh, you can also open our final round. Yeah, now I also, I especially want to use this word for all the young people that are listening, because I, I want to tell you all this, really our field at the moment is maybe the, it's it's such an exciting time frame. There are lots of opportunity to discover all kinds of new things and not only toys for the boys or the girls, but also really new things that might open up uh, all kinds of options for new interventions to prevent or to treat mental health conditions. So I really expect breakthroughs. And, um, and I think the way to do that, for that we need the older people. They have to really, take a lot of time and uh, to also intervene on policy level. And I know, for instance, Maria is spending a lot of evenings on, on FPA and uh, we as a board also try to do that on a European level. And that's very important because I think we have to be overly ambitious to try to get like really a lot of money to do better. So my wish is that we take up all these opportunities and work together and uh, try to do better. And I think actually we will, we will. And, and hopefully I, I will still be young enough to witness this. <laughs> Great, thank you. Christina, what's your wish? Okay, I, uh, I think we are in a marvelous situation to, to go forward. Uh, they, I, in my opinion, from a, from a theoretical point of view and from a, 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 a methodological methodological point of view, we have advanced a lot. In my opinion, also the, the technical advances, the using technology uh, can change the, the uh, natural psychological treatment and the way they are delivered. Uh, I think we can be with the user and offer help as well and is, is needed. And then, in my opinion, we can offer expanding also from a, a, a societal level health services and uh, diminishing the burden associated to me with suffering mental disorders. I think we have a long task and I hope I am uh, <laughs> very optimistic about the possibility of improving our health, work together. Thank you. Maria, what's your idea? Um, 
Th thank you. I think what I come out of this with is hope, hope for the future with such discussions and such opportunities for us to come together and discuss this and, and, and think things through and, you know, open our minds for, you know, new possibilities, new ways of looking at things, new collaborations, new avenues um, at, at all different levels, like Claudie presented from like the individual all the way up to society. I think it's really exciting. And, and you know, um, I come out with a lot of hope for the future and for all of us to engage in all this, to materialize all these possibilities that our profession can offer uh, to the world. Oh, thank you for these positive words. Aiko, what's your final comment and wish for two, the future brief, of our field? Two hopes or wishes. Um, thanks, Winfried. Two, two specific hopes or wishes. The first is as somebody who has had a career of a few years reanalyzing data, I wish we were better in sharing data with each other. Mental health disorders are really complex things. I'm collecting a huge data set at the moment. I'm going to share that because it's bizarre to think that I would be the most qualified person on earth to analyze my data. There's so much information in mental health data. So, um, and I, I know privacy is an issue, but it is not a bigger issue than in other areas of medicine where people do share their data. So I think I would like to, to stress, you know, open your file drawers, work with your colleagues from other departments, share your data. And the second point is something Claudie brought up, um, symptoms. I think language use has been a barrier in our field. I think we're keeping, very few of us here today believe that depression is a unique, clearly defined thing that is the same for every person and fundamentally different from anxiety, from schizophrenia, right? Most of us believe that these are descriptive, possibly useful heuristics that categorize people in some way. But I think the way we use uh, language in papers, risk factor for depression, genes for schizophrenia, and so forth. We keep redefining these concepts, and I think it's it's problematic and dangerous and stands in the way of sort of embracing the complexity. I have no solutions for this, by the way. Claudia tried with components and elements instead of symptoms, and the reviewers <laughs> keep pushing back on that in my papers. It's not going to be easy, but I'm at least, for, for myself, I hope we can think about the language we use a little more and maybe make progress that way. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I think what we have heard tonight is the discussion at a breaking point, at a tipping point of our field. Uh, science has a first uh, uh, task to, to simplify things, to develop rules, uh, and uh, we can think about Newton's principles of mechanic. So, but that's, science has a second task to recognize when uh, the time is over for these simplified models and when we have to do the next step. And I think this is the point we are now. and. Which, came, which became very clear in all of your statements. So I'm really grateful for your stimulating uh, comments. Uh, and uh, so thanks again. Thanks, I think, for the, from the whole audience. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our next uh, panel discussion. So people, uh, please uh, get registered. And maybe Marta can even announce the next date that we, al that we already fixed. So I hand over to Marta, our fantastic organizer of all these events. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Marta, maybe uh, you have some last words. Um, thank you. I'm just one of the organizers. I'm not the only organizer. As you know, it's a huge effort and it's a collective work that we do. So from me, a massive thank you to all of our panelists for your inspiring but also humble discussions and for your honesty that things are difficult where they are and I, I wish to thank the audience for asking questions and uh, we were able to answer some and then um, our next webinar is in middle may and i believe it's 17th of may um, and that will again be a tuesday so watch the space um, I, I can promise you that it will be another fascinating and honest and humble talk um, so thank you very much. We will see you again in three months. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>